set up with the Lowe's bucket. Then you want to use, I would say, probably two cups of denatured alcohol and two cups of water mixed together. Then you get your 24 pack of towels. For some reason we went. Mix your alcohol and your water in here, stir it together, and you use your towels, and you can just leave the towels inside that with the lid on it. Whenever you want to clean a case or clean an instrument off, just get this out, wring it, wring it out really good, and you might want to put on some plastic gloves. I mean, it won't kill your hands. It's just alcohol and water. And wipe it down. That's a good way to uh, have something on hand that will kill germs. Now it's a little bit, it's a little bit too stout to leave a, a plastic mouthpiece in there for, you know, 30 or 40 seconds. But it's really good for, you know, cleaning off instruments. If you do, if you use this method to clean off a lacquered instrument, be sure and go back over the top of it with pledge and a soft towel, like a piece of flannel, pledge and a piece of flannel, or a piece of a t-shirt. So. Any questions about that? Uh, in the chat, um, Ralph asks about uh, beginning band sign up and instrument tryout procedures. Uh, Ralph, do you mean uh, specific to the situation we're in right now or more in general? COVID, he said, yes, 20, 2020. Instrument tryout procedures or beginning band recruiting ideas. We sell a tryout mouthpiece kit that's really good. It was um, Jupiter just came out with it probably two months ago, back in first part of May. Uh, Ralph, I'll send you that that link. That I'll send that email. It's a it's kind of a short video that uh, talks about how to use it. I think it would be really good. Um, you know, Hal, if you don't mind, even if it's when we're finished here and uh, Professor Fuderer starts the second hour, maybe drop that link into the chat here for everybody. I will. I sure will. Thank you. Okay. Let's talk about preventative maintenance for woodwinds. Um, you know, the most common problem with all woodwind instruments is friction. And the the friction is within the key mechanisms the number one thing to fight friction is key oil i just the number one thing we use in our shop is super slick key oil it's got a little pin or on top can you guys see that it's got a little pin oiler what you do is you you work the keys and you oil all the pivot points with the, the pin oiler because I'm not kidding when I go into band rooms every every single instrument that I pick up has a pivot rod a hinge rod I'm sorry or a pivot school pivot screw backed out of it and it's because of friction those rods and screws and pivot points get dry, and as you work the keys, they back out. So key oil is the number one thing to fight friction. And you can get that at your favorite music store or online supply house. Another problem with uh, woodwinds is worn pivot points. Now, the right way to fix a worn out pivot screw is to replace it with an oversized pivot screw, but that can be expensive. The next best thing is to use a product called Loctite on a pivot screw. 
and Al, forgive me again for interrupting, for, but for many, maybe any of us uh, brass people, remind us what the pivot screw is specifically. What a pivot screw is? I see you got advanced, you got a camera person working the Zoom. I do. That's impressive. That's impressive. This is Talon. He's, <laughs> he's a lifesaver. Outstanding. Um, a pivot screw is a little screw that holds all this stuff in place. There's two different kinds of pivot screws. There's what you call a headless pivot screws, pivot screw, singular, that you, that's mostly used on flutes. And the idea behind a headless pivot screw is you can screw it all the way in. I'll show you how it works. You can take your screwdriver, screw this screw all the way in. See how this D key is working? It's going up and down. You keep tightening it until it quits. And then you just back it out, just barely. That's how the headless pivot screw works. You can take all the lost motion out of the, out of the, the key mechanism. So what happens is these pivot screws become really worn over time. And like I said, the right way to fix it is to have them replaced with oversized pivot screws. But the next best thing is to use the blue Loctite. And you don't just take it and squirt it on the pivot screw. What you do is you take a little a needle of any kind. I just happen to have a pin vise with a with a needle spring in it, probably a, a saxophone size needle spring. And what you do is you just put a little drop on the needle, and then you put that needle just touch the needle to the screw. And, and you can tell when it hits the threads because it'll kind of disperse into the threads. Once it disperses into the threads, you hold the key back in place and you put the screw back in. The same way you did before, you bind it with the headless pivot screw until it stops working and then you back out until it works again. Does everybody understand that? Now, with the headed pivot screw, I have a question in the chat, Hal, uh, about the blue material again. What is that blue chemical you were adding? This is a, this is a product called Loctite. It's a small, sold at every hardware store in America. There's green, blue, and red. Blue is the medium. Um, we've tried green. Never tried red because that's really, uh, green is softer than blue, blue's medium, red's, I don't think we could get the screws out if we, let, if we use the red. But uh, this is what, this will keep the pivot point really tight. It takes up all the slack. It's like putting rubber in between the screw and the post. Does everybody know what a post is? The post is what the screw review screws inside. This is the post right here. The post holds the pivot screw that holds the key assembly onto the instrument. Okay. So does that answer your question about the blue Loctite? Eve, she's nodding. Thumbs up. All right. All right. Um, the headed pivot screw is typical on bass clarinets, all saxophones. You just turn the screw until it stops and you're done. Um, typically, you don't use Loctite on those because the Loctite will get back in between the head and the post and it makes it hard to remove the screw 
the next time you want to remove the screw. So I only recommend this on headless pivot screws for flutes and clarinets. So um, any more questions about, uh, about Loctite and pivot points? Um, the next thing I want to talk about are pad savers. 30 years ago when I first got into this business, I didn't really like pad savers because every time I removed one from a saxophone, the saxophone is the one that everybody used back then. I don't even think they had one for flute and clarinet. But every time I worked on a saxophone, it looked like it was shedding on the inside of the instrument. It got blue stuff all up in the pads. Well, they've since changed that. And so they've gone with a more synthetic material. Uh, it's like cotton, but it's not cotton. It soaks up moisture really well, and it doesn't shed anymore. Um, the reason I wanted to talk about pad savers, I'll show you the flute and clarinet one as well, is because, you know, this is preventative maintenance on woodwinds. Um, these soak up moisture. If um, the next best thing to one of these is just a pull through swab that you can use. Everybody's familiar with those. So I just wanted to kind of touch a little bit on pad savers and how they changed and because I think they got a little bit of a bad name when they first came out. So, all right. So let's talk about preventative maintenance on brass instruments. Um, this is a mouthpiece truing tool. These are about $30, and these are really good to prevent or to straighten out mouthpiece shanks. In a mouthpiece shank, all you brass players know what a mouthpiece shank is. It's the, the part that fits inside the, the receiver on the instrument. Well, the problem with these shanks is they get bent. You want to look inside that shank and it wants to be you want it to be perfectly round okay if it's not it's going to get stuck inside your instrument more often that with the combination of lime deposits and scale it acts like sandpaper and almost like a glue if you put it in with a little bit of force so you want to use this these are good on all brass mouthpieces. And what you do is you put it inside and on the top side of the dent, you're gonna see light or a, a dark space or a light in between the uh, mouthpiece truing tool and the mouthpiece. And what you wanna do is you wanna use a mallet and just tap that high spot down onto the mouthpiece shank until it's round again and that will prevent it from getting stuck and it just makes it makes it easier it's it's makes it probably makes it sound better if it's you know if it's round again so I want to talk about that that's a good thing to do to keep mouthpieces from getting stuck on brass instruments Al, how, how often when you see those mouthpieces in student cases are the beginning of that shank abused? Always. That's um, amazing. I, I, I thought so, that that might be your answer. You know, I, I, I had someone make a, the analogy to me, like if you just put your thumb like a quarter inch over the water coming out of your garden hose. Right. That's the effect that that has on that air column for those people trying to play those brass instruments. That makes a lot of sense. You'd be surprised how many uh, uh, sousaphone mouthpiece bits and tuba mouthpieces, the bigger the mouthpiece, the harder it falls, the, the, the more it dents. Yeah. So uh, that's a good point. And that is such a great, easy fix. Yeah. Just, yeah, just tap, 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 a little tool. Yeah, if you... Um, 
rawhide mallet. Now, I don't suggest using a metal mallet, a metal hammer, because it's you can get these thinned out too much. This is the the end of this shank is the thinnest part of the mouthpiece, and so if it gets too thin and too brittle with hammering on it, it's going to crack. And so the best way to fix that is just saw off the part that's cracked. But that takes a little bit of skill and precision to, to make that cut right. Um, any questions about mouthpieces, brass, brass mouthpieces? No, uh, Tom Chetnik's here. He, he made a, an interesting point in the chat here that you've put together a, a band director friendly uh, emergency repair kit with uh, some of the uh, tools that you're demonstrating today. I have done that. Um, there's a really good website called uh, it's Botol Tool. That's um, that's in my handout sheet. That's on that's the link that I sent you. Okay. That is a very good tool company for getting supplies and tools for instruments. So that's in the handout at the link it is. in the chat. Great. Uh, Botol, Fariz, and and J L Smith. Now, Fariz and J.L. Smith are more for, they like you to be a repair shop, but uh, Botol, man, they've got some really good products and they'll, they'll sell tools and supplies to anybody. So, Terrific. yeah, it's real easy to deal with. I like their, their tools are really innovative. They got their own leak lights and everything. So, great. Um, Again, the number one culprit for stuck mouthpieces is the, the shank being bent and lime deposits built up on the inside of the instrument. Um, I wanted to hit that. Um, I want to show you a, a really neat job that you can do on trombone slides that, are, that have hangups in them. And most, on most beginner trombone slides especially, when they're not lubing them correctly and uh, when they're not taking care of the slide the way they're supposed to or they're, they're just learning how to take care of the slide, every one that I pick up, if it's for a beginner or even a junior high student, it's going to be pretty bad. So all you have to have to, to make a big improvement in slide action on a trombone slide is you need to have a, a little bench vise. Can you see this bench vise right here? You need a bench vise. You need a trombone slide tool. It's a slide cleaning rod. And what we're going to do is we're going to put this inside the vise. And you need a can of WD-40. WD-40 is going to be really good for cleaning the inside of this, this slide. And you need a four inch piece of a t-shirt, or this is actually flannel. And so what we're going to do is we're going to thread this through the, the rod, kind of like a bow tie. Can everybody see that? Yeah. And you take your WD-40. This has silicone in it, which is really good for coating the inside of the slide. It's almost a treatment for any kind of metal silicone is. And you want to just put a little spray on both sides of the stockings. The trombone players know what the stockings are. And you want to work it in really well. And then, of course, wipe down the excess WD with your spare rag 
make sure the rag's clean, especially get around the stockings because you're actually cleaning the inside of the tubes as well. Now, you have to be very careful not to ram down into the end of this crook and dent the crook out. So you be very careful, just go really slow. And what you do is you bend it over, bend over the bow tie like that, or where there's felt on the end, and just clean it out. Clean out the inside. Just like that. Just take your time with it. Get the, the front part of it. Just try to get all that WD-40 out of it. And see, see all the stuff we got out of there? Now what you want to do is come in, use the other side of the bow tie. Now you have a clean side. And you want to do the other side like that. Just clean all that WD-40 and lime. Now, I said lime, but technically, the WD-40 is not going to clean, not going to cut the lime deposits, but it's, it's going to help a lot. You're going to have a little bit of residual WD-40 on the outside of the outer tubes. I'm going to clean that off. And then you'd be surprised. I mean, it's just three simple little tools. I mean, this slide feels 100% better dry. And it's just a $15 bench vise, $5 trombone cleaning rod, and a can of WD-40. Make a huge difference. You can do 10 trombones in probably 20 minutes. A trombone so, cleaning rod comes in the case of a lot of the instruments. Yeah, you're right. It does. Are there any questions about that little job? All right, getting into some more repairs here. Let's talk about brass. We'll kind of we'll kind of go back and forth between small woodwinds and brass. That way, we don't leave out the woodwinds at the end of this thing. So we'll do one brass fix and one woodwind fix. Let's talk about frozen valve caps. In order to lube a valve, you have to remove the cap. And if it's frozen, you have to use a rawhide mallet. And the way to do that is put pressure on the cap counterclockwise. All valve caps loosen counterclockwise. And you just barely tap. It kind of makes a, a tinty sound whenever it's it's come loose. So I've never this has never failed me for removing a frozen valve cap. It doesn't matter if it's a sousaphone that's been sitting for 20 years or whatever. Whenever you tap it with this, sometimes you have to tap it on different sides to to loosen the metal. Um, it always works. Um, in extreme cases, you may have to use a metal hammer, a dent hammer. You, you just have to be real careful with it because especially on a brass valve cap, this is going to put little dents in it if you hit it too hard. So I would stick with this if you possibly could. That's the... Uh... That's the problem with pliers too, right? You can too easily damage the two. Right. Yeah, you see Ken grinning right there? Yeah, that's him causing some problems. <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah, the, that tool, like I said, that tool's never failed us for getting loose, uh, frozen bow caps loose. Um, let's go to a woodwind. Fix. 
Um, I want to show you a tool that I could not live without. This is called a feeler gauge. And what this is, it's, the te it's technically a pin vise. It, uh, well, this little piece of cellophane tape is like a little piece of a, like a, I don't know, cellophane off of a cigarette package. You know, that real thin plastic. This is probably one thousandth of an inch thick. And this is really good. This is a really good tool for checking leaks on pads. Um, like, for instance, the first thing I do on a clarinet, if I know it's leaking somewhere, is you have to use your feeler gauge and check the 12 o'clock position of the pad, 3 o'clock position, 9 o'clock position, and what this, what this little one thousandth of an inch piece of silicone is doing is it's grabbing the pad. If it does not grab the pad, then you have a leak. Of course, let's not forget about the six o'clock position. So what you do whenever you're checking these pads on, on any instrument, you use a feeler gauge. And if you have a leak, for instance, if, um, if this pad was leaking in the six o'clock position, I would heat it up, tilt it a little bit with a uh, pad slick, and reclamp it. That's what I would do. But this, this is a very, very good tool to have in your arsenal. This, this works, like I said, on flutes, bass clarinets, clarinets of all kind. It's not really good for saxophones. Um, I recommend leak lights on saxophones. But any other instrument, this is a great tool to have. And whenever you're replacing water key corks on brass instruments, you don't want those to leak, so you need to check and make sure, you know, you've got all the all your clock covered with this feeder gauge. So how, when you find with that gauge that you've got a leak, what do you do next? Well, you have to inspect the pad and, and see why it's leaking. If, uh, if the pad is real swollen on the middle, you're gonna have to replace it because it's got moisture on the inside. And when you get moisture on the inside of a pad, it's typically because the pad's broken somewhere. Hmm. And, uh, so you just have to replace the pad. Um, any other questions about that, the feeder gauge? Let's go back to a, um, this is a real easy one. Removing stuck mouthpieces. Um, one of the, the tool company link, links in the handout is called Fareeze. They're in Battle Creek, Michigan, and they designed this mouthpiece puller back in the 70s. It's called the G88 mouthpiece puller. And this is the most common puller in the world because it's just, it's so versatile. Um, it works on all brass instruments. And the way it works is most of you already know this, but the collet goes around the mouthpiece, and then the jaws go around the receiver, and then you take the slack out, now, a lot of times, this puller is not enough. I'm going to mount this in the box. A lot of times, the mouthpiece puller, I'm going to say probably half of the time. And that's the main reason I wanted to show you guys this, because half of the time, the mouthpiece puller by itself is not enough. 
to remove frozen mouthpieces. And I wanted to make sure this mouthpiece was stuck so I could demonstrate. That's why I, I pounded it in with my hand. So, what you want to do, this is another great reason to have one of these mallets. Because what you want to do is you want to put a lot of pressure on this mouthpiece. And then when you have a lot of pressure on it, you want to tap around on the receiver to see if you can see if that helps get the mouthpiece loose. And sure enough, it always works. And in extreme, in extreme cases, you have to use a metal hammer. But you'll just have to tap real easy around the receiver. All the way around it. To, it's kind of like removing a frozen valve cap. You want to, you want to tap on the receiver to, to vibrate the mouthpiece shank and the receiver. So that'll let loose or let go. Any questions about that little job? Hal, this is Ken Williams. Uh, not a question, but I just wanted to comment about that. Uh, with the rawhide mallet, that's a really a good, because what I've found on some of the uh, beginner horns is that the uh, rim at the top of the lead pipe is not thick enough for that mouthpiece puller to grab onto. And so if you try and put too much pressure, it'll just slip. They'll slip past. So that's a that's a real good idea with the with the uh, rawhide mallet. Yeah, yeah. There have been times when I've actually found myself in a band room and a director asked me to remove a mouthpiece and I didn't have my puller, so I just used the the mallet and hopefully I can get it out. And I've I've been able to do it. First time. first thing I do when one is really stuck, uh, I take it to the teacher's lounge and put it in the refrigerator. For a few minutes, a lot of times the unequal cooling of it will will just loosen it loosen it up. So I've heard that. I, I've never tried that, but I've heard about that. That's, that's a good idea. I'm going to remember that. All right, let's go back to the woodman. Say we um, we want to replace going back to that clarinet pad that's uh, that's bad if you want to replace it there's a few tools you need this is a little micro torch it's by Benzomatic um, these are really good to have in your arsenal to reseat pads or remove water corks remove any kind of pads or um, just for, they're for minor jobs. You can't soft solder with them or anything like that, but they're really good to have. So it's also good to have a striker because they're a little bit hard to light. And the good thing about this one, it's got a little fuel control so you can control the fuel. All right, so you always, whenever you use a, a torch of any kind around a woodwind instrument, you always want to aim, aim your flame away from the instrument. So you want to touch, almost, almost touch the pad cup with your flame, with your blue flame, until you can see the pad move around a little bit. We're going to remove that bad pad and replace it. This is called a pin vise. I've showed you this a second ago. We're going to get in there and get that pad out of there. All right. Mission accomplished. We got the pad out. Um, if this is the plastic clarinet, you want to kind of put a tool in between the the cup, the clarinet pad cup, and the tone hole to keep the hot pad cup from melting into the tone hole. Um, you know, 
people that haven't done this before might get the pad cup too hot. And if it touches the plastic body immediately, it's gonna it's gonna hurt the tone hole. This is a really good tool to have in your arsenal. This is a little baby Valentino repair kit. And so this has a lot of water ports and assortments of uh, clarinet pads. I think this is about $100. It's even got a couple of uh, little clamps for flute and clarinet pads, little makeshift clamps. Um, but I'm going to show you how to do it with a real clarinet pad, just in case you want to do that. This is the the B30 clarinet pad from from Fareez. and it's got the it's the traditional clarinet pad with the skin on it. And what you want to do is you want to use this little needle spring and poke in the side of the pad. Can everybody see that? Can everybody see where we poke the pad? So we poke the pad. The reason we're, we're perforating the side of the pad is because whenever we heat it up, that will keep the pad from swelling up because the, the heat and the air on the inside of that pad has to go somewhere. So this will keep it from swelling up on the inside and make it easier to seat the pad. Okay? So what you're going to do is you're going to inspect the inside of that pad and make sure there's, there's not any pad left over from the old pad. You light your torch. You're going to put that pad in there like so. Oops. Heat up that pad. So and let it seat itself. I think that, that torch is getting close on being out of butane. So let's use this other torch. This is another torch that I've had in my arsenal. This is called a blazer torch. This one gets a little bit hotter. You can you can soft solder with this torch. So if you if you want to use it on clarinets, you need to turn it way down. Again, point the heat away from the pad cup. Heat it up. See that it's seating. The glue is going to almost self-level it on a little 10 millimeter pad if we have to we'll use a pad slick and level the pad but this thing pretty much leveled itself so we're going to go ahead and clamp it let it cool off for a while and then we'll check it with the feeler gauge Are there any questions about replacing clarinet pads and checking clarinet pads with the feeler gauge? I know that's a lot of information. We're just we're just kind of scratching the surface here. Doesn't seem like any questions, Sam. All right. Let's go to the next brass thing. Um, we're back to our to your your mouthpiece truing tool. This thing has multiple uses. Um, you can remove frozen slides with it as well. Now you have to be really careful because the slide has to be almost the same 
contour of the end of this mouthpiece truing tool. The good thing is this fits right down inside there, and you can you can easily tap out slides with this. Now, what I like to do, if you have a frozen slide, say the second slide is frozen. I like to use a little bit of key oil, or you can you can buy penetrating oil, which which works just as well or better. But I like to use key oil. It seems to be a little bit more friendly to the finishes. And then you want to light up the torch and just barely heat up the slide tubes on the outside. Keep your, keep, keep your flame moving so it doesn't burn the lacquer or burn the silver or melt the solder if you get it too hot. So once you have it heated up, you might want to let it sit for five minutes, let the penetrating oil or the key oil do its job, and then use your mouthpiece truing tool and tap out the slide like so. So this works like a dream on the first, second, and third slide of a trumpet to remove stuck slides. It just fits in there perfectly. What role does the heat play, Al? Well, the heat makes the oil spread down into the inner and outer tubes. Oh. It makes it move down in between the inner and outer tubes. All right. Um, like I said, penetrating oil does work a little bit better, but I just like to use the key oil because it's a little bit more friendly to the instrument surface, the instrument finish, if you will. All right. We got a question in the chat, Hal, uh, back with the pad replacement. Mm -hmm. um, do you need to add glue? Yeah, sometimes you'll have to add glue. Um, what I recommend is, um, well, the best thing to use is stick shellac. You can buy that at the, the Botol place I was referring to earlier. Um, if you want to go a little bit, uh, a little bit more uh, economically, you can use uh, hot, hot glue, you know, the round hot glue sticks you can buy at Walmart or any hardware store. Uh, the problem with hot glue is it's a little bit more messy. It just it kind of strings everywhere. You have to be careful about it. Uh, you can get it on the instrument, but you know it's there's a learning curve with with both of them. I'd say the negative thing about the stick shellac is uh, it has it gets it sets really fast. Uh, you have to you have to keep heat to it, and get it where you want it, and uh, and then you have to clamp it once you feel like it's in the right right spot. So yeah, glue is, uh, there's several different glues, but the two I mostly recommend are the hot glue and the uh, stick shellac, the amber stick shellac. Good Terrific. Question. All right. Let's go back to uh, the woodwinds. One of the most common problems I see on a clarinet is the the B and the C adjustment down here. Whenever you play low B on the clarinet, you want to use either the, the side lever or the low B spatula. The problem is a lot of times it's going to be out of adjustment. And it doesn't make that sound. Doesn't make the, the low B doesn't come out because you've got lost motion right there. So what you want to do is you have to adjust the crow's foot. Um, so in order to do that, you have to hold down the crow's foot key and push up on the crow's foot. 
the best way to do that is with a pair of duckbill pliers on the spatula itself. And you put it back in adjustment. And of course, you want to use your feeder gauge to make sure they're both in adjustment. Now, before you do this adjustment, you have to make sure both the B and the C pads are are seating correctly. Because if they're if they're not seating correctly, you're wasting your time. So you want to check the six o'clock, three, twelve, nine o'clock positions first on each one of the pads independently. And in order to do that, you want to go ahead and take it out of adjustment first. See how there's lost motion. So now we can check the C. All right, so I'm going to hold that down. The pads are seating correctly, so now we can adjust Crow's foot. Still out of adjustment, so we're going to come up just a little bit more. And then just being real careful not to scratch the top of the spatula. I want to talk to you for a second about these duckbill pliers. Some people call these smooth jaws job pliers because there there's there are no corrugations in the pliers, and this is what most repair techs use on woodwind instruments because they don't tear up the instrument. So you can get those at any of the the, uh, the tool companies we, we referred earlier. And so we're going to check BC adjustment again. And it looks like we're in good shape. So that's a real common adjustment I do just about every week in some band room. And it's just a real simple pro's foot adjustment. But there are times when you know, the pads have to be replaced. So it's easy to it's easy to find out with your with your feeler gauge. So, all right. Um, how much time do we have? Well, it's uh, three minutes to five, but uh, not really. Aaron Futurer, it's Ken, says in the chat that uh, if you need a few more minutes to go right ahead. Okay. All right. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about trumpet valves. Another real common problem with uh, with brass instruments is sticky valves. And um, there's a real, real easy way to take care of a sticky valve. You just have to do a few things. And um, I'm fixing to show you how we do it in our shop. And it wouldn't take you very very much money to have a few things available for you to, to be able to do this in your band room. Um, this is a Fariz product, kind of like the mouthpiece board. It's the L58 Ultra Smooth Valve Lapping Compound. And so, you, for instance, if you have a sticky valve on a trumpet or a baritone or a tuba or whatever, what you want to do is take it apart You want to go ahead and remove the felts, remove the spring and the guide assembly, that's hard to get out of there. And then put it back together with just the valve stem and the finger button. And this is it's this is the case on all brass instruments. I'm going to use a little bit of lapping compound. 
doesn't take very much. It just takes very little. And spray bottle. Maybe not. Okay, we have to pretend to have a spray bottle with water. You spray water on it. <laughs> and then you want to take off the bottom cap. Go ahead and remove all your other valves and slides. And you want to lap in this valve by going back and forth. And go ahead and, and uh, line up the slot the way the, the guide slot is supposed to be lined up because that's going to be the natural position of the valve inside the casing. And you want to lap in the valve. And lap it in for three or four minutes. Now, if you have a dent in the casing, I don't recommend this because we need to remove the dent first. But anytime we do dent work on a valve casing, we go back in with lapping compound and we do that. After you lap it in for a couple of minutes, um, the easiest way to clean this is with Dawn dishwashing liquid. You get a bow casing brush, wash it all out real good, all three casings, because sometimes you can get a lapping compound in the ports. So go ahead and clean it all out with dishwashing liquid, clean off the valve, and you'll be surprised what, uh, what difference that'll make. Um, I want to talk about this real quick. Hetman valve oil. This is synthetic valve oil. This is what most of the military bands use. This, um, you can lube a valve with this in March, like we do on sousaphones and marching horns. And in July, when they pick them up, the valves work like they were lubed yesterday. This is really good valve oil. It's synthetic. It doesn't go away like the petroleum valve oils do. Uh, the Shilky slide grease is the best stuff in the business. Um, so that's what we use in our, our repair shop. Uh, are there any questions about lapping valves? Well, I guess we need to turn it over to Ken. I've already gone a couple of minutes over. You guys have any questions for me? Let's see. Uh, yeah, uh, looks like no new questions on the chat. Um, but uh, Ken points out he's got a link on the same website with information about his presentation. Um, Hal, you're going to post a link to the um, that kit that uh, Tom mentioned. Yes, correct. Uh, right. And the rest is on your PDF that's on the site. The rest of the links that you referenced in your presentation. Correct. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Can't thank you enough for taking the time in the middle of the summer here to join us, Hal. Um, really, really valuable information. A lot of the chat comments here have been, oh, I've got that tool and I didn't know it did that. So uh, nice. very typical for all of us here who had a little, this, a little of this information perhaps uh, here and there. Uh, down the line, but uh, thanks for not only taking the time to do this tonight, but for what you do all the time for all of us here in Arkansas, and you're such a good friend and colleague to all uh, bands in Arkansas, and we all know that, so thanks again. All right, thank you.